name is Mark Cousins, and I run the General Studies uh, and teach in the History of Theory program with Gordana Karolia. Uh, really, in a sense, this conference originates um, in a, a thought that Gordana and I had um, about really how we would like to shape and see the tasks of the history and theory program itself develop. Obviously, students are highly individual and will choose their own work to concentrate. But nonetheless, uh, I think it's always a good idea for such a program to have a project. And in a sense, I think the, the project of the History and Theory program um, has two armatures. One is uh, to do work within the unit, which will gradually permit us to write or to conceive of what you might call a revisionist history of modernism. It seems to us that one of the most lamentable aspects, really, uh, of graduate work on architectural history and modernism in this country is the relative naivety with which the whole period and the discourse of modernism is approached. If one takes a, a simple example, it seems to me that what you might call the historiography of modernism within the fine arts, uh, the sorts of accounts offered by Rosalind Krauss, by Hal Foster, but one could name a number of others, represent an altogether more ambitious and rigorous attempt uh, to conceptualize modernism and its fate within the fine arts. And that there really is lacking any such parallel uh, attempt within the field of architectural modernism. For the most part, people are still content with fairly bland narrative histories concentrating upon the careers of the good and the great, hoping that somehow it knits itself uh, into a rational story, which it certainly doesn't. The reason, of course, for doing this is in order that we might situate ourselves now, situate ourselves in terms of architectural culture. One can see very clearly in the States a major division opening within schools uh, as to the kind of position they take on design and its link to the history of modernism. There are those, I think, who think uh, that the project of modernism is exhausted, has finished, and the responsibility of the designer is in a way to search for new morphologies, uh, to search for new forms without being burdened by the discourse of modernism. And there are those for whom uh, the project of modernism is not yet exhausted and is one which in a differential way still influences the thought of design. In a way, we don't want to intervene directly in that, but to begin to prepare for what it might be to give a revisionist history of modernism. Now, linked to that, I think that there's another point which bears directly uh, on this conference and the series of conferences which we think might be related to it. It is that, in some senses, um, the period where architectural practice was presented theoretically with some master discourse, which was nonetheless external to architecture, most obviously, for example, the work of Derrida, and this is no criticism of the work of Derrida, but nonetheless sets up a certain unhealthy relation uh, within an architecture school if 
what it turns out is that people feel they have to have read or they have to know something of Derrida in order to translate it uh, into design terms. Uh, one and the same time, it overprivileges a certain theoretical position, while at the same time wildly simplifies the relationship between theory and architectural practice. It was really for this reason that we thought one useful thing uh, which the program might do, and it's very nice to see people from kind of other programs uh, in London and from around, because I think we, we thought this would best be done on a kind of cooperative, uh, possibly even later on collaborative basis, is really to go back into the 19th century and to identify a number of figures whom it might be interesting, as it were, uh, to have a conference and a discussion on them in which we put to them certain contemporary questions. In that sense, these conferences, and this one in particular, is not designed as a purely scholarly and historical investigation of Semper, though it sort of would like to sort of start from that position. Um, it's really one which asks of Semper in the first instance and then of a number of other subsequent thinkers, what are the resources themselves within architectural theory for architecture to continue to think itself and to practice itself. So that really, I just wanted to say in welcoming you here, uh, is our rationale uh, for the conference. I hope everybody has um, an account uh, of the day. Um, we actually have an, an extra short paper uh, which will be given, we'll put in this afternoon by Eric uh, Wegerhoff called The Haze of the Carnival Candles. Uh, Eric being a student in the Intermediate School and it's a great pleasure for us at these to present not only the work of teachers uh, but the work of, of students and of graduate students. Finally, I can't really um, start this conference without giving my profoundest thanks to G Gordana Karolia, who's really taken on board almost all, let's just say all, the work uh, of preparing this. And it's been a great labor, and I, and I hope you, by the end of the day, will be extremely grateful. Gordana, thank you very much. Okay. Um, we reckon we've asked people to produce papers of roughly half an hour uh, within the terms of a three quarters of an hour slot, so we hope that there will be time um, for uh, some discussion. And perhaps even during the year, sorry, even during the, the day, um, we can sort of advance and save a bit of time so that perhaps at the end there's some time for some general observations. Uh, or questions. It's a pleasure, first of all, to introduce Mari Vartum, uh, who lectures in general studies at the AA and whose doctoral work was on Semper. And her paper is going to be on the poetics and practical aesthetics in the writings of Gottfried Semper. Mari. Thanks very much. Um, my paper today is trying to put together a fairly huge argument, and I thought, how do I do that within half an hour? So I thought, I have to start with a story. So here is the story. In October 1848, the British Museum, just over there, received a very remarkable shipment from Constantinople. It was the finds of Austin Henry Layard, the notorious um, adventurer and diplomat, who after just a couple of months of excavations had unearthed um, a palace whose last, had last been mentioned in 
the Old Testament, namely the King Ashurnasirpal II's palace in Nimrud. And until 1854, when the Crimean War put an end to this financial extravaganza, the British Museum amassed an incredible collection of Assyrian art. And it was a collection which would, be, would profoundly shake the Hellenophile art history tradition in Britain at a time. And it was also a collection that shook and shocked the audience who witnessed its arrival to Bloomsbury. And among this audience was um, a German architect who had temporarily stranded in London under rather unhappy circumstances, namely Gottfried Semper. Semper must have studied the new acquisitions to the British Museum very carefully because years later, in the first volume of <coughs> Der Stiel, the Assyrian collection serves as a key example in his theory of the origin and the development of art. And Semper was particularly captured by a fairly modest little stool, this um, Assyrian stool, the Assyrian Cecil, that he keeps talking about. And this stool became the subject of an extraordinary series of analysis where Semper set out to trace the iconography of the chair back to its supposed origins, back to what he calls the primordial motifs of art. So carefully examining and fairly obsessively examining this stool in its minutest detail, Semper um, tried to trace every little molding, every little scroll, every little joint back to its supposed roots. And the origin story that he tells through this analysis was really rather wonderful. He argues that the, let me see if this is the right one, the stylized joints of the stool echo the motifs of binding, they echo the motifs of the knot. And he argues that the moldings of the chair invoke the motifs of the wreath and the ribbon. And for Semper, these textile motifs are nothing less than the origin of art. And they derive from a universal human desire to imitate, to imitate the rhythmic patterns of nature, the cycles of the sun, the changing of the seasons, etc. This kind of imitation that goes on in these motifs of art was, according to Semper, an imitation that started with the ritual. It started with the reification of time and movement in the rhythm, the dance, the musical expression. And then it would slowly be translated into um, the domain of art and craft. For example, in the rhythmical movement of weaving, in the symbolic gathering performed by the knot, etc. So these primordial motifs of art were, were essentially for Semper ways in which the cosmic condition were, was being represented and was being represented in a manner that could be specifically comprehended by man, by humans. So establishing a specifically human domain within a threatening nature. Now Semper goes on and on and on about this Assyrian uh, furniture and he um, goes through them in an impressive and slightly obsessive, as I said, detail. The animal heads, for example, that flanks the, the chair is for Semper both a crowning and completing of, um, of the composition of the stool. And as such, they express both a religious concept, i.e. the gathering of parts into a unity, and they express, obviously, a structural reality, a tectonic reality. So what Semper is telling us in this series of analysis is that the motifs of art as we see them in this seemingly, seemingly unremarkable little chair is, are the symbols of primordial ritual acts of binding, of joining, and of completing, which over time has been gradually translated from their origin in textile art into the materials, metamorphosing into ceramics, into metalwork, into masonry, and somewhere along this line of transformation, finding their tectonic expression in the stool. Now, for me, this little excursus on Assyrian furniture does go some way to explain why Der Stiel, despite its horrendous prose and its incredible long-windedness, 
was seen as one of the most important contribution to aesthetic theory in the 19th century. Because through some very simple descriptions of some chair legs, Semper seems to manage to simultaneously evoke the history of the Middle Eastern civilization to present a tale of the origin of art and to put forward a theory of symbolic form. And what Semper, I think, proposes here is, in fact, quite radical. He rejects here the whole neoclassical tradition for thinking about the origin of architecture. He chucks out the supposed primitive hut and he replaces the origin of architecture as instead being the <coughs> ritual action. And he states this quite explicitly in one of his later essay where he says, he puts himself a rhetorical question and says, in a most general way, what is the material and subject matter of all artistic endeavor? And he answers, I believe it is man in all his relations and connections to the world. So although Semper does reject completely the neoclassical doctrine of imitation, i.e. architecture as an imitation of the cave or the tent or whatever, he still sees architecture as a kind of imitation. Not an imitation of things or of forms, but an imitation of rituals, i.e. ultimately an imitation of human action. Now this would ring familiar to several of you. Aristotle in the Poetics proclaimed the ends and the means of the tragedy as lie in the imitation. For the tragedy is not an imitation of men, he says, but of actions and of life. And I think this is quite interesting. I think that Semper's rethinking of the origin of architecture, in fact, has quite a lot in common with Aristotle. Um, mimesis in the Greek tradition was not a copying of something which was already there. It was rather a creative interpretation or an ordering of reality as a whole and thus bringing a human order into being. Uh, and for Semper too, art is this kind of ordering activity because what goes on in this little stool, in all these scrolls and moldings and bits and pieces, it is an example of a primordial ordering of reality, which is first expressed in the ritual, then slowly reified into the motifs of art, into the motifs of craft, and the motifs of architecture. And it is through this ordering activity, Semper says, that man captures the creative law of nature as it gleams through reality in the rhythmical sequence of space and time movement. Um, and then he goes on and says that this movement is found once more in the wreath, the bead necklace, the scroll, the scroll, um, the beat of an oar. These are the beginnings out of which music and architecture grew. So it's precisely the kind of mimesis that goes on in the poetic work according to Aristotle. It's a kind of Emplotment, if I can use Paul Ricoeur's term, it's a kind of gathering of reality into a story, a story which is somehow comprehensible to uh, man. Or if I can use Ernesto Grassi's word, it is an ordering of reality into a world. So embodied, I think, in Semper's musing on these chair legs is a poetics of architecture, very much in the Aristotelian sense a poetics which allows for a reading of architecture and art, not as a formal or as a stylistic um, phenomenon, but as architecture as a creative interpretation of human life and of human action. Now, I was reading Der Stiel in the British Library, um, and I was very excited about what I read when I plowed through this huge Assyrian analysis, because it is fantastic. And I was so excited that I had to then go for a walk, and I obviously went in to see the Assyrian collection in the British Museum. So I was wandering about there. And what do I find other than Semper's Assyrian stool? Can you, re can you recognize it? Do you see it? It's in the middle. It's mirror image in the printing of Dashti, but it's certainly the same stool. It is still in the British Museum, it is in the bas-relief from the Northwest Palace of Nimrud. Um, it is not simply a stool it transpires, it is a throne. It is a throne of King Ashur Nasir Pal himself. And the king is seated on his throne, he's surrounded by priests and officials, sort of demigods, and he's 
involved in a ritual of purification. This relief form a part of a huge frieze which was placed in the king's throne room and which was symbolizing and representing the role of the king in a cosmic and political context. Standing in the British Museum and suddenly looking at this visual narrative, um, it became very clear to me that Semper's analysis of this stool, however profound and however wonderful, took a very strangely narrow point of departure. And in fact, contemplating these panels, it started to seem to me that the most remarkable thing about Semper's analysis was not so much what it included as to what it left out, what it didn't talk about. Because while Semper does examine the stool in totally minute and totally obsessive um, detail, he remained completely silent about the situation in which the stool is apart, to the extent that he doesn't even draw in the king, or he doesn't even mention the fact that it's a throne. So the, although Semper was obsessed with the symbolic significance of the furniture, it is, a, and although he tried to you know, locate the religious and the social and the historical and structural significance of this stool, this symbolism that he deals with remains a strangely imminent one. Insofar as it excludes the context in which this artwork is situated, it excludes in this particular example, it excludes the context of Assyrian kingship. And it is almost as if the poetic role of art, i.e. the role of art as an imitation of human action and of human situation, has somehow for Semper stopped, stopped in time, frozen, on a prehistorical level with the formation of these motifs of art. And then art has somehow retreated for Semper into a completely autonomous domain which can be the subject matter for the art historian or for the scientist of art as Semper saw himself. And it can suddenly be analyzed not as an imitation of human action, but as a purely formal phenomenon. Now, there were very good reasons why Semper somehow retreated into this aesthetic imminence in his theoretical project, because his aim was not only to find the origin of art, but it was also to find a method of invention based on strictly scientific criteria. And in fact, his project was not to provide nothing less than a complete science of architecture and art, a science that would throw full light on its conception, its transmission through time, and his future invention. And Semper called this science his practical aesthetics. Now, why was this science necessary? Well, for Semper, it was absolutely urgent because he saw his own time as a time of absolute crisis and decay. He saw his own time as a time in which the decline of taste and the decline of morals had made architecture and art into an absolutely shameless shamble of um, imitation and mindless invention. And being a true 19th century man, and Semper, you have to remember, was a man who had listened to Comte speaking in Paris in the 1830s. The only way he could envision to save architecture from this chaos was to turn it into a true science. And more specifically, a comparative science, a science that was to be modeled on the great successes of comparative linguistics and comparative anatomy. This is a, a, a long story, but we can try to cut it short. Foucault points out in The Order of Things that the comparative method as it grew out in the 19th century presupposes certain things. It presupposes that the object of study, the things that are to be compared, has to be absolutely accessible, entirely accessible to the scientist. Let me explain this with an example. When the French anatomist Cuvier, whose collection we see here in the Jardin de Plantes in Paris, when he formulated his comparative anatomy, he did it with the hope of giving to anatomy the same scientific legitimacy as, say, physics. 
And in order to achieve that, he has to make sure that his object of study, that is nature as a whole, could be seen as a system, could be seen as something which in its entirety could be accounted for by a scientific explanation. Now, in a pre-modern tradition um, for thinking about nature, this had, of course, not been possible as long as it always included some idea of a final course, a god or a purpose or, or destiny or whatever. So in order for Cuvier's science of life to be possible, he has in a way to chuck out a 2,000 year long tradition for thinking about nature. And he had to reject the idea that nature has a purpose outside itself and to presume that nature can be understood as an imminent system, a system which can then be explained by the natural scientist. Cuvier proclaimed, purpose of, the purpose of an animal is present in its bones. And um, for the first time, perhaps, the meaning of nature is seen to reside in nature itself. This goes back to a huge philosophical shift, which obviously we can't go into here. It has to do with Kant and the notion of organic systems, where suddenly it became possible to see nature as an imminent um, a self-sufficient system which is somehow available for our understanding of it. Um, I can't go into that. But what is interesting to me here is that something very, very similar happens to Semper's analysis of the Assyrian chair. When, although Semper is obsessed with the symbolic significance of the stool, it is a significance which is ultimately present in its bones, so to speak, and purpose has become, as Semper would make clear in his London lectures, purpose have become an internal coefficient of the work of art. I think it's better to, we can better understand this strange immanentization, to use a horrible word, um, if we look at an example. And I think Semper's, Semper presents his, the framework for a comparative science of architecture very clearly in his sketch for um, the, an ideal and universal collection, which exists as a, as a handwritten manuscript of the v &A, if anybody wants to um, go and have a look at it. This fictitious collection, which was a collection basically containing everything, um, became in Semper's mind a vehicle by means of which you could understand the very principles governing human production, human making. And it took the form of a great comparative display in which artifacts were arranged according to what Semper saw as the four prime more deal techniques of making. So you have textile art in one square, you have ceramic art in another square, you have um, carpentry in one square, and you have masonry in a fourth square, the four primary techniques of making. He left out metalwork, but that also figures among them, usually. And in the section, for example, containing textile art, what he does is that he starts with what is his the absolutely primordial motifs of textile art, the simplest knot, the simplest wicker work. Then he would follow the transformation of these motifs into more sophisticated techniques like that of the braid, that of the weave, that of the embroidery, whatever. And then he would follow it into the Semperian principle of Bekleidung, i.e. look at how the, how the motifs from textile art metamorph metamorphose into other materials. For example, the, the cladding of a wall with tiles or the um, panel cladding, etc., etc. I'm sure we'll hear more about Bekleidung later today. And so all the primary techniques of making would be traced in this way from their simplest expression and then on to uh, their most sophisticated and sublimated expressions. And this collection would, in Semper's mind, constitute a sort of index, he calls it, a sort of index to the history of culture. And I'd quite like to read to you um, his description of the, the, the collection. He says... A complete and universal collection must give, so to speak, the longitudinal section, the transverse section, and the plan of the entire science of culture. It must show how things were done in all times, how they are done at present in all the countries of the earth, and why they were done in one or the other way according to circumstances. It must give the history, the ethnography, and the philosophy of culture. Nothing less. So by following these motifs of making through time and place, 
this collection would offer not only the history of art, but it would display the history of mankind as such. And this is an extraordinarily ambitious project. It's a project in which the full meaning and the full manifold of human creativity, as it were, should be displayed in one complete overview, in one universal and ideal collection. Or to, and, and this overview would then, in its turn, provide the key to a true science of architecture, a true uh, practical aesthetics. Just to try to sum this point up in, in some other words, by means of an ideal and universal collection, establishing this comparative overview over the whole province of art, as Semper calls it, he aimed to reveal the laws of artistic making, not just display things, but actually reveal what kind of laws were involved in their making, and then to render these laws available to the observation, to the explanation, and ultimately to the prediction of the art historian or the artist himself. So within the laboratory, as it were, of the comparative matrix, the riddles of art, the riddles of creativity, was to be solved once and for all. And a method of invention, an Erfindungsmethode, would emerge. The theoretical counterpart to Semper's ideal collection, uh, we can find in the um, infamous um, formula for style. And I'm sure most of you have seen this before. I can just quickly go through what the different things mean. The why here is the result, as Semper calls it, or the, actually the work of art, or more precisely actually the style that unites individual works of art into a sort of coherent phenomenon. The X, Y, and Z, etc., are what Semper called the internal and the external coefficients of art. And that is basically everything that influences artistic making, everything from material climate to religious uh, structures, political structures, uh, history, culture, everything. The world is in there. The F is the expression for the relationship between these coefficients. So it's the, the way, in a way, this mysterious pr translation of cultural factors into an artistic making. So art, works of art and architecture is a product, according to Semper, of, of the interaction of certain factors, some of which are changing, other of which are constant through time. And these coefficients, as I, as I said, they don't include only material things. I mean, Semper was certainly no materialist. They include literally everything from religion to politics to cosmology. Um, so what we see here is a very, very ambitious attempt to determine the correspondence between culture as a whole and artistic creation, uh, whether it be art or architecture. And it is a an attempt to give, with scientific certainty, a correct architectural expression for a given culture. Now, I have to say, um, to be fair, that Semper never tried to implement this this formula. I mean, he never actually tried to plot in the conditions of, of modern society and out would come, you know, the true work of art for today. It is a crutch. He makes totally clear that this moves on an analogical level. It's not to be, have any sort of practical implementation. However, the presuppositions behind this formula I find still very thought-provoking. What it presupposes is that every single factor of human culture, human history, are accessible to the scientist come historian, to the artist. Accessible to be defined, their relationship defined, and artistic production is in a way de dependent on this transparency of culture. So, it presupposes, even if it moves on an analogical level, that it is possible to define all factors working on and working in human culture, and that history, in a sense, can be understood as an imminent system, as a system in the sense of, of the Cuvierian system of nature. And only in this way can the possibility of a scientific knowledge of our historically constituted world or a historically constituted art be guaranteed. <coughs> 
Let me try to sum up the argument that I've been trying to construct and then to try to spell out what I see as the central tension in Samper's work. The practical aesthetics here presupposes that the work of art in all its aspects could be understood as a result of a clearly definable coefficients and their interactions. And by means of this analogy, um, Semper could formulate a theory of style, which was his lifelong ambition. A theory of style that would both have explanatory power and a predictive capacity. Remember that it was primarily an Erfindungsmethode that he was after, a method of invention for the artist. So it could explain the you know, development of art through history, but it could, it could also somehow give us a method for how to create. And yet, I believe, Semper achieved this theoretical coherence, this relative theoretical coherence at least, at the cost of abandoning his initial insight into the poetic capacity of art. This may need just a, some last few comments. From the point of view of an Aristotelian poetics, art is the tragedy, poetic making, is a vehicle for interpretation. It's a vehicle by means of which the horizon, if I can use a Gadamer's expression, the horizon of the human world uh, could be brought to a partial articulation, but only partial because we, history is not transparent for us and Aristotle certainly knew that very well. So the poetic work in the Aristotelian sense is not a result of already defined coefficients is rather bringing things into reality that didn't exist before, or it is changing even the world in which it is brought into. The practical aesthetics, on the other hand, sets up quite a different set of presuppositions. It's the practical, for the practical aesthetics to be possible, all the factors affecting art, all the factors affecting human making, must be fully defined from the outset. They must be definable, as coefficients in the formula for style. In a way, histori history and culture must be definable as coefficients um, in the formula for style. So maybe if I can put it in, a, in different words, I could say that while a poetics takes the opacity of art as its point of departure, the practical aesthetics requires a complete transparency of history and culture before the act of making can even begin. So while the poetics would have a revealing power, it would reveal more than, than what you knew before about the world in which you were in, the Semperian practical aesthetics demands that you know it all already before you can even start putting your hands at work. Habermas describes this shift, and it's a shift that doesn't only happen with Semper, but, but is notorious throughout 19th century thinking. It's this kind of, Habermas describes it as a kind of a flattening or in the realm of, of reflection, a flattening in which ontology is reduced to epistemology and then ultimately to a method which is supposedly transparent to reason. And I believe that Semper's practical aesthetics very much testifies to this flattening because he started from a concern, a very profound concern, I think, for the ontological significance of art, i.e. the meaning of art for human life, the meaning of art for our existence. But he ended with a purely epistemological project, an epistemological construct, if you like, in which the question of the meaning of art has been replaced with a question of how can we gain knowledge of art? How can we construct a science of art? I started this paper by trying to get my head around the curious sort of compression of meaning that takes place in Semper's little analysis of the Assyrian stool. And I can end, I think, by saying that, that the, the very strange immanentization that goes on here is more than you know, a rather sort of idiosyncratic fiction of, a, of an increasingly paranoid German architect. It is a symptom, I think, of something that goes on in modern thinking on art in general. It's a strange schizophrenia going on in which the work of art on the one hand more and more retreats into the sort of subjective madness of the genius and on the other hand 
becomes more and more the object of a supposedly scientific art history, architectural history. And certainly all of us here who are architectural historians, um, it, it does represent quite a question mark. And I think it is in this territory, which I think this dilemma in which we're still existing, I think, that a study of Semper has become increasingly relevant, both, I think, to appreciate the depth of his poetics of art, which I, I still rejoice in when I read his little analysis of Asteria and Stolz and other things, but also to appreciate the limitation of his wish to establish a science of invention. Thank you very much. It's, um, I had some problems when I, when I was using it. it um, Semper uses in German the word motif, which is sort of easier to use in German, I think, than in English, because it, it can be confused with motif. Um, but uh, he uses it as a distinctive feature of a design. So he can use it to express the relative consistency of certain motifs, like the motif of, of the knot. Um, it's a fa fairly straightforward term in his way of using it, but it becomes a key one in his terminology because it is by means of these motifs, they are in a way the primordial motor of art, as it were, because they are the ones who, who remain relatively constant through time. They're translated into different materials. They're translated, let's say, from you know, the, the knot into the chair, they're translated, but they remain relatively constant. Um, and he does use musical analogies in explaining that constancy, you know, as a motif in, 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 in Mozart would come uh, through the symphony in many different guises. In the same way, these motifs keep reappearing through architectural history in various guises, being translated, always translated, into the materials and the uh, other requirement of the, you know, the the particular culture that produced it. So the musical analogy is a very good one for Semper because he, he thought very much along those lines. I think he thought about uh, architectural history as a sort of grand symphony or something. He's in an incredible dilemma here because he does appreciate you know, that art is the product of a, a historically given 
culture. And he doesn't want to leave that out. And he doesn't leave it out completely, but what he does is to boil the whole human culture, as it were, down into something captured in the joint of a stool that can be captured as a completely formal, almost stylistic phenomenon. So in a way, he, he doesn't leave <coughs> cultural considerations, symbolic considerations out, but he curiously boils it down to <coughs> almost nothing, in which you can suddenly read out the whole history of Middle Eastern civilization from looking at this one joint of a stool. He has some very similar musings on, on Egypt, where, for example, the the, the low point of gravity in the temples becomes a direct illustration for the political structure of Egypt at the time of the, you know, the, the hierarchy of priests, etc. So it becomes an incredibly reduced kind of symbolism, an incredibly reduced way of thinking about the relationship between culture and architecture. And I think it becomes so reduced, not because Semper was a reductivist, he was a, you know, a highly sensitive uh, ap appreciator of art, but because of his insistence that he had to establish a scientifically legitimate footing for architecture and thus save it from you know, the crises in which it was in. So I would say in his, in his analysis of the stool, he doesn't chuck it out altogether, but he reduces it so much that it starts to become almost a, a parody of itself. For this occasion, I would read in order to sort of keep my thoughts concentrated, not to meander too much. <coughs> As a topic for this paper, I have chosen to discuss the question of polychromy and whiteness. This does not attempt to be an all-embracing and exhaustive study on the matter, which was so widely debated in the 19th century. Rather, I would like to pose some questions in respect to Semper's negative reference to Wilkeman. Uh, regarding practicing architects, it is well known, Semper raises his critical voice primarily against Durand, uh, whom he accuses as a chancellor of the Exchequer of the failed ideas. He dismisses bizarre practice of pattern books and copying, thus promoting his own search for a more authentic approach to architecture. However, when it comes to debate on polychromy, as in preliminary remarks, his opponent is definitely Winkelmann. It is Winkelmann who was so close to understanding the ancients, and the Greeks in particular, who lived in Italy when Pompeii was already known, and who still failed to acknowledge the color on the monuments. Winkelmann was apparently so close to them, and yet he failed to unfold them truly. Semper writes, and I quote, Politics and art have always gone hand in hand. This is how he starts. Winkelmann was the new prophet, the first in four centuries to turn back to antiquity. Yet, like those old masters, he also fell into the error of looking upon the fragments of antiquity as a complete text and interpreted them in his own way. That's uh, his uh, mentioning of, of Winkelmann in respect to uh, colors. Now, why was Winkelmann approached in this way? But also, why did Winkelmann indeed fail to recognize this very fact about polychromy? Even empirically, Semper tells us, it was still possible to notice the color at the recesses. Winkelmann, who managed to penetrate the Greek art, so successfully failed to see and acknowledge these colors. How was it possible? What was preventing him to see the colors? Semper found Wilkeman more responsible than other fellow architects who made stronger claims. 
the question is, why do, what does his naming of Wilkeman in his essay stand for? He indeed does not mention anybody else by name <coughs> uh, in that respect, nor other architects, no, not usual people who he, whom he attacks in respect to their doctrine of the primitive heart. But Wilkeman's name was there. <coughs> the answer <coughs> uh, I would uh, like to propose may open as following. Winkelmann based his method on a combination of personal vision and meticulous reading of objects. As we know, Winkelmann was doing that in the 18th century and thus, uh, in a way, almost a century before um, uh, Semper, uh, in a way some 70 years is uh, between Winkelmann's uh, uh, major work, Observations on Architecture, and uh, Semper's text on, on preliminary remarks. So here I'm summarizing on Winkelmann. He based his methods on a combination of personal vision and a meticulous reading of the object. In his case, the statues, first of a Dresden museum and later in Rome. His rule was first to distinguish the antique from the new and then to develop a certain empathy with the work observed, which was in most of the cases the white marble sculpture. Wilkeman has thus worked in the relation to the white complex surfaces of, a sta of the statuary upon which the light must have projected most delicate shadows, thus establishing a new approach for the art history. In this approach, material surfaces, masses and contours, but not the color, were clues to higher ideas, inner forces and spiritual concepts that he addressed. In relation to architecture, uh, Wilkeman's work <coughs> uh, could be summarized as following. Wilkeman, who read the ancients like Vitruvius, Trabo, Pausanius, and the moderns like Alberti, Perrault, Leroy, Piranesi, uh, held uh, the view that architecture consisted essentially of two elements, its material construction and its ornamentation. For Wilkeman, according to Widler, Architecture must primarily be defined by its material nature and its limitations, while its aesthetics has to be drawn from practical experience. In describing the principle of construction of the antique stone walls, Wilkman derived the principle of symmetry, which he treated as an external principle of composition. He was indeed obsessed by the techniques of joining materials. He described city walls, John without cement, surfaces paved with white, polished stones cut into different forms, Alantica. He even corrected Perrault on the name for certain patterning. Wilkeman, <coughs> and that's all for a non-architect, Wilkeman made a concentrated attempt, concentrated attempt so that the empirical technique of building was translated into the aesthetic principle. <coughs> it's out of form, presenting its uh, more elementary in a construction. Wilkeman devotes a great attention to ornament, his second element in architecture, which possesses its own nature, according to him. Structure and ornament should complement each other, but should never be confused, writes Wilkeman, clearly following Perrault and writing it uh, out in 1760, just six years <coughs> after Logier's essay on the origins of architecture. In all this, Wilkeman is completely in agreement with the prevailing attitude in which structure is highly respected, be it from the architects like Boulet, Chambers, or Jesuit Logier. The clear opposition between the structure and the ornament, where two are never to be confused, form <coughs> the metaphysical opposition in the minds of the 18th century believers in structure as the true primary and oldest element of architecture. They see it clearly and without doubts when they watch the ancient ruins, the site both of learning and contemplation. It was a site of knowledge for Perrault, Piranesi, Leroy, and also Logier, a site from which they derived the principle of origins of architecture and they saw it as monochrome and ultimately, I would argue, white. For Wilkeman, the site of a ruin was also a place where his erudition and empathy were meeting the aesthetic qualities of the object the account of which, we could argue, has dominated his discourse and art history. <coughs> but this clarity of the image of a ruin, its status and its originary, its unmistaken, sorry, its status of the originary, its unmistaken structural workings, its transmillennial material resistance, were all there to stray the viewer, to stray him and to suppress every consideration of the soft 
and a more ephemeral part of the building, even if that might be as crucial as something like the dressing or color dressing, farben begleitung, as uh, Semper would put it. There was an expectation on the behalf of Semper from the writer of the observation on the antique architect, uh, uh, observations on the architecture of the ancients. That is to say, uh, there was an expectation on behalf of Semper from Wilkemann. This expectation indeed comes from the fact that uh, Johann Joachim Wilkemann was not only a scientist of architecture. His contemplation on art and architecture went further. He acknowledged architecture's more ideal status in respect to arts in Plato's scheme of things. Wilkemann's method, uh, Wilkemann's method of observation of the surfaces of the sculpture was the experience which he indeed extended towards architecture. He writes it in an um, extraordinary uh, comparison, and I quote from Wilkeman. The forms of a beautiful youth resemble the unity of the surfaces of the sea, which at some distance appear smooth and still like a mirror, although constantly in movement with its heaving swell. So it is with the beautiful youthful outline, which appears simple and yet at the same time has infinitely different variations, with that soft tapering difficult to achieve in a column and still more so in the diverse form of youthful body. Among the innumerable kinds of columns in Rome, some appear preeminently elegant on account of this tapering. Of this, I have particularly noted two of granite, which I am always studying anew, writes Wilkeman. In this paragraph, in a single move, Winkelmann mentions a whole diapason of things. He mentions the surface of a youth's body, compares them to another surface, that one of the sea. He refers to the outline, the privileged category of the post-Renaissance artists and architects, but the outline is here difficult to achieve without the attention being given to the complexity and the infinite variations of the surface. Of the anti-myriad of, of columns in Rome, he was struck by two which are mentioned as granite, hence not marble and not white. Now Semper implies that from the point of view of empathy in relation to the object, an erudition understanding text of it, um, which includes understanding text of antiquity, Wilkeman should have been able to bring in the discussion of polychromy. However, he has not. Why? Wilkeman's own work, The Art Theory, which was based on white sculpture, would not suffer, uh, as it were, much resistance. On the contrary, it did relate successfully to the existing attitudes at the time, such as importance of the outline as a clear form, the myths of antiquity and uh, its arts, and so on and so forth. Semper wrote uh, 70 years later, and I quote, above, above all, it is difficult to persuade people that the ancients could have covered such a magnificent material as white marble with paint. Yet apart from the oldest monument of wood and clay, most surviving of all all the Greek temples were built on a gray, very common marble-like limestone <coughs> or porous shell lime and were covered with stucco before the surface was painted. White marble was chosen only later and then only when it lay nearby or for unusually magnificent buildings of the later period. So Sef Semper expresses, um, uh, constantly expresses his kind of surprise how the public at the time was still uh, not quite accepting the idea of polychromy despite all the kind of evidence that was coming from Hittorf and the others uh, about uh, the nature of the monuments indeed being colored by the by, by the paint. He refers to the modern writers on the aesthetics, without naming them, who spoke on the, color, uh, on the colored sculpture with a sense of horror. They claim that the color confuses the eye in judging the form outline. Semper, on the contrary, argued that color clarifies the form because, as he puts it, it, co if it color provides it, color, provides the artist with a new way to throw the surface into relief. It brings the eye back, he says, to the natural way of seeing. 
which it lost under the sway of that mode of abstraction that knows precisely how to separate the visible and inseparable qualities of the bodies, the color from the form, <coughs> knows it by those unfortunate principles of aesthetics." Unquote. Semper accuses Wilkeman for agreeing to the privilege this is like my, uh, my interpretation, of, uh, for agreeing to the privileged link to monochrony and whiteness and thus stopping short from opening up the question of polychromy. He also finds aestheticians responsible for perpetuating this unfortunate condition. However, he does not name them, thus leaving <coughs> the name of Wilkeman only. We could probably cons uh, guess that he might be thinking of people like Baumgart and, and indeed even Kant, but he, he wouldn't sort of name them. We can read Semper's attitude as a political point, particularly when we read it in the context of his subsequent discussion on polychromy as the expression of democracy. The first chapter of the four elements explores the understanding of the polychromy as an organic artistic expression of a democratic constitution. Greek polychromy, I quote, is no longer seen as a mere isolated phenomena. It is no figment of the imagination, but reflects the feelings of the masses, the general desire for color in art, and in the middle of the new movement, important voices have been promptly laid in its support, argues Semper. Polychromy, therefore, now becomes for Semper a synonym for the artistic expression of democratic form of government. I quote, in Greek antiquity, this harmony could result only from the free yet binding alliance between elements with equal rights, a democracy amongst arts, unquote. Where Labrouste used the polychromy debate to attack classicist normative, uh, normative aesthetics, uh, Semper, we could say, made it a basis for the socio-aesthetic critique. Semper rejected the attitude <coughs> in uh, Four Elements, Chapter 5, which made structure the essence of architecture and thereby bound the latter in iron chains, as he puts it, deriving his ideas from what he refers to as the circumstances of the primitive human society, Semper comes to his idea of the four basic elements from which architecture has involved, uh, heart, roof, enclosure wall, and earthwork or mound. Now, <coughs> regarding the wall, he traced the wall as textile partition. He tra traced the wall as textile partition back to the realm of the decorative arts and had used the colors in textile as a final proof of his theory of polychromy in architecture. Etymologically, he points out that the word for wall, uh, in this case German wand, um, is cognate with gewand, meaning garment, covering the earliest architecture. For Semper, the, root, the roots of architecture were always related to the origins of, as it were, the other arts. Now, in distinction to the 18th century primitive hut, to the 18th century discourse on the primitive cut, uh, with its constructual emphasis, Semper desired to use his elements to suggest a relationship of a free people inspired by national sentiment. This is not unlike the proposition of Ruskin or Morris, who believed that the Middle Ages embodied a social structure that was still intact and drew corresponding conclusions for architecture and other arts. Like them, Semper suggested that by having in mind that the wall as partition, wand, evolved from a woven hanging, a wall might be decorated <coughs> and painted as a, as a textile. In On Style, 1869, Semper further developed this uh, conception of the relationship between history and architecture. He saw architecture as dependent upon social history. He maintained that the Greek model was still universally valid because of being democratic. But how does color translate into democracy? Now, here I would just like to stop uh, and sort of analyze uh, the, this kind of terms for walls. Um, one being, um, for Semper, being this wand, which is this kind of woven wall, uh, partition wall. And um, I would like to compare it with a discussion of walls which 
I have undertaken elsewhere, in which I have chosen to compare two dominant terms for rules, uh, which uh, in the Western discourse were primarily kind of centered on, on two uh, notions, on, on, on two terms. Um, that's the term parius, which it refers to something like a partition wall, and muri, um, which in a way um, refers to something else. Now, if we consider the terms for the walls parius and muri, which in antiquity stood for walls of and within the house and the city walls respectively, that is to say parius was referring the term parius in Vitruvius and antiquity in general was referring to the walls of the house in and of the house and Muri were referring to city walls, we can start uh, to map the change in respect to these terms as it happens sub subsequently. What was in antiquity and middle ages, the defensive wall of the city Muri have moved in the 16th century to become the wall of the house. At the same time, the term for the walls of and in the house, parius, has moved to mark the walls of the body in anatomy. This is a part of a long study, which in a way um, I have undertaken in relation to some of the Renaissance texts and in a way could be kind of clearly followed. So what is important is that what was in antiquity and in the Middle Ages, the wall of the city, in this, that is to say Muri, in the 16th century starts to refer to not just a city wall, not just the defensive wall of the city, but starts to actually be referred to any other walls in the, in, in, in the city itself. Uh, in this new distribution, we, signed, we find that certain regime which was established by the defensive faction of the city, walls, Muri, has been placed inside the city in order to delineate and defend particular buildings and their position in the hierarchy of the city as a whole. At the same time, what we refer to as our bodies and its membranes today was once considered much further out, but that's a kind of a separate topic. Now, moving the heavy defensive wall into the city was an event in the history of the city which marked the break from the ancients and the medieval, medieval constellation of the city as Ruskin and Morris still uh, rightly noticed. Semper's search for the new elements and his attempt to revise and recapitulate on the nature of the walls within the city could thus also be seen as an attempt to remove the heavy defensive muri from the city. For that, his want related to Gewand is closer to the concept of parius in the sense in which it existed in antiquity, this soft walling within the kind of city where in a way, uh, where in a way outside a a walls muri are kind of removed. Semper also quite rightly acknowledged that this organic organization also has to do with the nature of a political life within the city and was skeptical about the future. To conclude, in exploring the question of polychromy and whiteness, what the naming of Wilkeman stand for, <coughs> and now I'm trying to sort of break the argument about the colors and polychromy, which in a way worried uh, Sempa in, in Wilkeman with this kind of discussion about the walls. Um, in exploring the question of polychromy and whiteness, what the naming of Wilkeman stands for is the insistence on whiteness, okay? For Semper, the name of Wilkeman stands for this insistence on whiteness as part of the method itself, something which allies itself with the notion of the outline and presumes outline supremacy over color. This persistence of whiteness remained with architecture even after Hithoff's or Semper's reclaiming of the colors. As Mark Wigley has shown, it has passed into the construction of modernist paradigm and indeed, if we can put it for this occasion, modernist style. Indeed, white walls of modernism pose the question of what is their status and in particular, what is, um, what is it in relation to the city? What is the status of white walls 
what is the status of White Wall's modernism in relation to contemporary city? Is it like the name and the method of Wilkeman standing for the constant examination of the contour and the surface and suppression of the color on whose behalf? This suppression might take different guises, search for the origins, discourse on hygiene, or of the Isle Gallery, or more recently in architecture, reworking of the architectural avant-garde. But it is this suppression which has alarmed Semper, I would argue, under the name of Wilkeman. So you could see that I have sort of used uh, this kind of anxiety uh, and this kind of worry that Semper uh, sort of uh, expresses when he discusses Winkelmann. It's, uh, he's concerned about um, Winkelmann uh, not bringing out the question of colors where he, showed, uh, where, where, where he thought he should have. And he's also concerned that, uh, and he also says that this is also political. I'm just kind of reminding you of the, of the quote that I had at the beginning when he says, politics and art have always gone hand in hand, and Wilkeman was uh, to sort of be encountered in that kind of context. So what I have done, I have in a way shown, I, I have tried to show that uh, in a way what worried Semper under the name of Wilkeman was this suppression of color was this kind of arguing for the supremacy of whiteness, for the supremacy of contour um, and surfaces expressed by the contour, supremacy of outline, whilst in a way color was um, something which was put aside, something which in a way was Semper had all, uh, sorry, Winkelmann had all kind of historical, um, uh, as it were, um, conditions to sort of refer to color, but he, he just didn't. So in a way, what is worrying here is not that in a way Winkelmann was lacking historical evidence, but in a way that that historical evidence was not used, and this is what Semper says is political. Now, I've been sort of trying to also link it to the modernism I've been trying also to link it to the, to the discussion about modernism and indeed to link it on a separate uh, uh, side with a discussion about the walls uh, by trying to sort of say that uh, in a way the usual discourse on, on modernism which um, brings <coughs> the walls, and especially the white walls, under the guise of neutrality is to be find uh, quite problematic. I have suggested that Semper's insistence in a way of wall as wand, and in that sense closer to parties, to this kind of soft ephemeral walling, is something which in a way stands for his belief in democracy. It's something that in a way, in a way links itself with the color and color with the soft walls in a way provide in Semper's mind a condition for the possibility of a democracy. And he is at the same time expressing his suspicion that that is possible at, at, at the time when he writes it. So what I could just say to, 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 to kind of conclude this discussion, I would like sort of to conclude it in relation to modernism. Um, I would like to say uh, that modernism, in respect to the fact that it still kind of uh, has um, <coughs> built itself on the paradigm of whiteness very, very much, and on the paradigm of, of walls, white walls, moderni modernism in itself hasn't quite uh, yet acknowledged this uh, very problem, and I mentioned that in a way it is, um, uh, in, uh, it is mentioned in the in work of Wigley, but uh, what I have uh, r tried to extend in this situation is actually to, to sort of bring uh, the, the Wilkeman uh, here as well. Uh, modernism uh, hasn't quite, as I said, this cr uh, acknowledged this, uh, this condition, and it does not have a solution for this problem. Uh, primarily because it is still entangled with whiteness and enjoys the dividends it brings. 
At present, what it can do best is an aim for balance and non-exclusion of the other. And uh, what I'm here also uh, speaking uh, from is uh, from the experience of the course on whiteness, which uh, I have been teaching with Sunil Kinani and Philip Dodd, uh, and which was part of the London Consortium um, uh, teaching program, um, in which um, we have joined forces to um, address the question of whiteness. As an architect, I started um, quite um, innocently and naively uh, by not uh, acknowledging, as it were, full political implications of, of whiteness. For me, when I started teaching at the course, whiteness was simply um, the whiteness of uh, the Corbusian houses, the whiteness of Bauhaus, the whiteness was the white wall of, of modern architecture. Um, what was I so soon to learn that in a way many aspects, <coughs> including uh, to my surprise, including the question of race, were not far, and, and racism were not far away. That is to say that there is, no matter how difficult and, and for this occasion uh, almost impossible it is to sort of include all the kind of uh, political aspects that it brings, there is a political agenda linked to whiteness and to white walls. And in my mind, um, Semper's um, interest in both um, polychromy, which in that sense sort of acknowledges the problem of whiteness, and in walls which are not understood as Val or as Muri, uh, which is um, how they are understood in most of European languages in, in the 19th century, but uh, walls which are understood as this kind of soft wand. Um, which in a way is this kind of link uh, with, the, with the ephemeral walls of antiquity is an important political point. Thank you. Well, he does actually. He well, as Mary was shown, Mary has shown. Uh, he actually links the wool to to the textile, right? That's why I say it is the soft. That's why it's the wand. That's why it's not the valve. That's why it's the wand. Okay, so it's the soft wool of the textile. It's the soft wool of the garment. It's not the wool as it would be like in English wool, wool or in German wall, which in a way links itself to the old term valum, which is like muri in Latin, and which are all defensive city walls, okay, which as such before the 16th century were not entering the city. Okay. From the 16th century onwards, if we follow the kind of the interpretation of Renaissance text, we actually see uh, it, it, could be, um, uh, it could be fine that all the interpretations of what was previously just parius, city walls, now are referred to as muri, or in French and Italian version, and indeed in English version, wall, and wall in German. So in a way, the term parius completely disappears and is moved uh, solely to the anatomy in the 16th century, which is kind of interesting, but it's a separate issue. I should sort of keep it separate for the moment. But what is interesting, that the defensive wall of the city, which existed as such, as a defensive solely in antiquity and the Middle Ages in the 16th century moves into the city. And I say it's, it's quite a, you know, it's a, it's a big uh, defensive wall which is primarily to defend um, the palaces, the institutional buildings, um, enclosures of certain importance, and indeed it's, it's quite interesting that Semper refers to that condition again in a preliminary remarks when he says, oh well, in our time we shouldn't really have these defensive walls in the city, if you remember. He actually does refer to that because we don't have any more internal enemies to fight. 
and that's like in, in his preliminary remarks, that's when he's very young, when he's 30, when he will sort of write the style, he would sort of be much less uh, kind of optimistic about it and might much more disillusioned. But he believed at that point that it was possible to get rid of this kind of heavy walls, moory wall, and sort of have the wand, have the soft wall inside the city, and that, and, and that I think is an important point. But what I was uh, linking here is his um, quite, uh, what, what sometimes appears to people quite uh, strange or extraordinary that he links walls to weaving, to textile and, and texture in that sense. Um, uh, when people sort of find it as quite innovative, I was trying to sort of see how that argument as well as the argument of polychromy could be traced to antiquity and to indeed to ancient city. The argument about not having walls is an argument about Right. Well, I was here not, it, it's, it's true. But here what I was saying is not the theory of antiquity or what I think was happening in, a, in, in antique city or ancient city. I was just referring to the interpretations of antiquity as we sort of subsequently know them. And I was just following the etymology of the terms, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, and... Uh, I think it, it sort of opens quite a, a lot of ground. But what is undeniable is that there is this kind of move. Now, what, what would the kind of thing about the virtue say is that perhaps, do you, want, do you want to sort of suggest that there is a link between virtue or democracy and democracy or it could be contemplated? No, this is what I did. What he does, okay, he discusses polychromy. In, in his essay, Preliminary Remarks on Architecture and Statue uh, in Antiquity, he discusses both uh, polychromy in architecture and in statue. Yes? Semper, we are talking about Semper. In antiquity, yes. No, he discusses uh, he discusses polychromy primarily in relation to statue because he it says also in the title and in relation to temples. Okay, so he that's the part that's uh, the the early piece. Okay, the preliminary remarks, uh, remarks of polychromy. Okay, and there he links already the the possibility for democracy with polychromy. He links that it, uh, he says that in a way for democracy we have somehow to have polychromy, and he sort of links the uh, the, the Greek. He says that there was a direct connection between Greek democracy and polychromy. Okay, and he sort of e explains it through some. Uh, kind of reference to the organicity, that is organic kind of relationship, that's the organic city, that's the or, or organic natural relationship to have colors and to have democracy. Okay. He also extends that in the first chapter of, of uh, the four, he extends that argument further in the first chapter of the four elements. Okay. The argument about the walls okay, appears in four elements. And it, it appears in a schema, as Mari was showing, where he sort of discusses the four elements. And when he sort of has um, the heart, the, the, the wall as wand, 
then the mound, which I would say refers to the volume and uh, the, the walls as Muri, and, um, and the, the roof, okay, he there discusses uh, the walls, okay. He does not necessarily there uh, refer to democracy in relation to walls, but this is my input, okay. This is what I said. Although he referred democracy to the walls, he didn't sort of refer soft walls to democracy. What I have referred to is his suggestion of soft walls as parias, as wand, okay, could be seen also as part of the argument for democracy, okay, which he uh, addresses in relation to polychromy. Is that clear? He does not link the two, but I link the two. And I link the two because I opened up the question of two terms for the walls. We have now, that's the larger topic, but we now have one term, the walls. And there was clearly from antiquity until the 16th century, two terms for the walls. One for the city walls and one for the walls of the building and inside the building. Exactly. <laughs> well, I, I, Mari might, might know it better, but in a way, uh, what is, I didn't sort of want to get into the whole thing, but it obviously is related to his, to his kind of political involvement and barricades and so on and so forth. I, Mari, do you want to say something more about it? From, uh, we know that he was politically involved and has to spend some time in exile. Uh, because of his political involvement, and he was kind of living that life very, very seriously, the life of, of the walls on, on, one, on either side, whatever the situation will bring. Right. That's a good question. But in a way, it was, uh, Wilkeman did believe that that was the finished uh, a statue. He didn't sort of believe that there was color on top. He did not develop at least that argument. Uh, and this is precisely what uh, Semper is kind of, he spends quite a lot of time on that. And I think that's quite interesting. What he does, he, uh, he's actually surprised how come that Wilkeman and the others didn't notice that actually the temples and the statues glare differently in the sun because they sort of don't glare like the Milan Cathedral, which is really white marble, never painted, and so on and so forth. And in the sun it glares so badly that it's impossible to view it. While these uh, temples and these statues, which were painted, have this kind of gentle glow, which in a way suggests to his eye, that they were once painted. But he's sort of accusing them, how come they didn't notice it when the recesses, if one looks uh, carefully, would still kind of offer the possibility for the explanation that there was color. And he says, you know, the recesses still show. So in a way, the answer to your question is, um, yes, um, it, was, uh, it was the white statuary that Wilkeman was referring to, and he thought that was the finished one. And what did you want to say, uh, something? Right. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's now opening a, a, a new question. It's kind of opening like a question of, um, of, of whiteness as nakedness the whiteness as the kind of um, the final layer of the material which transpires and which is transparent in itself by sort of being itself there for us white. Okay. So that kind of opens a, a, another kind of set of questions. Uh, we'll was, was Linkeman trying to make a moral argument of the white sculpture? No, he wasn't trying to make a moral argument. He was making an aesthetic argument. 
he was making an aesthetic argument and if you want art historical argument because he used the as as I, I suppose most of the people know he used to, to to sort of look at all greek white sculpture in order to classify them according to their aesthetic characteristics to put them in different um kind of uh, groups which would then sort of be mapped up from different periods so he would sort of go from um, kind of uh, uh, archaic period like uh, from Homer till uh, uh, till um, Praxiteles uh, from Phidia to uh, to Praxiteles and so on and so forth he would actually have he, he sort of claimed that he wants to have five groups as, as Aristotle has in his classifications, but then he sort of leaves us with four, if I remember, uh, uh, periods of sculpture. And they also are to suggest some kind of life of sculpture that in a way goes from its infancy to its kind of development. Uh, but he sort of drops the fifth phase and sort of suggests only the fourth phases in the life of sculpture because he says it is just too difficult for him to talk about the dissolution, the fifth phase, the dying, as it were, of the sculpture. And he sort of says that explicitly, leaves that open, which is a point that Widler made. Um, uh, it sort of coincides very interestingly with the, with the kind of open-endedness of, of, of Inkerman's own life who was unfortunately killed in Trieste um, prematurely in the moment where he got some kind of gold medals from the empress. So <laughs> it's a kind of a completely kind of separate issue. But um, um, yes, uh, he doesn't make a moral argument. He makes purely aesthetic argument. In relation to modernism, uh, modernism is to make a moral argument. And uh, Wilkeman, uh, it's, it's really mainly, mainly the other architects, uh, people who, who would theorize um, the aspects of whiteness in relation to architecture and structure, who would sort of implicitly make a modern moral argument about architecture of the 18th century, where, as it were, the, the construction was seen as working, was, was seen as the good, was seen as the true one was seen as the one that is sort of to be respected. And in that sense, you could say they make more of an argument, people like Logier, people like um, um, Chambers, and others who follow the argument of the, ho of the primitive heart. They make the moral argument. But Wilkeman, he sort of acknowledges, as I said, uh, the importance of structure and the ornament. He sort of says they shouldn't be confused, but he sort of acknowledges the importance of both. 